I'm Graham Poston. I'm a surgeon here in Liverpool, but I know a lot of people in this room from both cities and from beyond. Um, and as Gail and as Juan have said, I'd really like to thank Cathy and the Foundation for the privilege of talking to you today and just try and begin to sort of pull things together. Again, as Juan said, we are totally dependent upon Andrea, Gail, Melissa, who are really the specialists that hold the service together, that keep this thing working. As you know, when you talk to each other during the coffee break, you'll find that you come from all over the Northwest and North Wales. Um, people come all over the place to come and see us. And, and the reason is, as you know, that this is a very uncommon condition. You, I, I say to people when they come and see me, if you took Anfield Stadium and Goodison Park on a Saturday afternoon for two sellout games, put the two together, you might find one person who has this condition. It's one in 100,000. But the reality about this disease is that when you talk to people about it, people have had this for years. You talk, when was the last time your bowels were right? Well, it wasn't when I was a teenager. And I've been going to the GP for 20 years and said I had irritable bowel. Well, in fact, you had this all that time. And for that reason, when we talk about the incidence, that's the number of people who actually get this being very rare. The other side of the coin, what we talk about the prevalence, is how many people are living with it is actually quite common out there. And the more people you find with it. And in fact, people say it is the second commonest, in prevalence terms, bowel tumor. Because most people with this have been living with it for years and years and years. Now, as Juan has said, a lot of people get by with very minimal treatment. As long as we can get control of the symptoms, then you get your quality of life back, and the object is to get on with your life. However, there is a role for surgery in this, and that's what I want to talk to you about. And the role for surgery really falls into really two groups. Um, the first is, in some cases, we can cure that particular neuroendocrine tumor with an operation and get rid of it. That doesn't mean, though, that you're out of the woods completely because something in your makeup threw that tumor up at that time. There's something going on in your genes that made that tumor, and there's a risk that having happened once, it could well happen again throughout the rest of your life. So we need to keep an eye on you for that reason. The second role of surgery, we use the word palliative. It's not really palliative like terminal care. It's sorting out symptoms that the tumor's causing, pressure symptoms, blockage symptoms, debulking the tumors because a lot of the damage is done not by the fact that this is a, a very slow growing cancerous process but in the functional tumors about half the tumors it's the excessive hormones that do the damage and we used to say if you went to an old textbook 10 15 20 years ago oh my god you've got for instance carcinoid oh you're going to be gone in three years oh that's what the book says well, the reason it said that is we didn't understand the damage the hormones did, the carcinoid heart disease. We didn't get on top of it. We didn't look for it. And we found people were dying of heart disease because if you don't control the excessive hormones, the heart disease will carry you off and take you off to meet your maker. Now we understand that much more carefully. We monitor the hearts. We look for all the various hormones that are being produced in excess, and we switch them off with somatostatin. And we can control that. And we believe by doing that, we can stop the heart disease happening. So don't use textbooks. Henry Ford, the great American engineer and inventor and, and car manufacturer, always said, I have no use of textbooks. Everything in a textbook is more than four years old and therefore no use to me. So don't go to the books. As Juan has said, be careful what you find on the internet. There's no filter to that. Use the stuff from people like the Net Foundation where there is a quality control measure going through. The stuff that goes onto the foundation sites, these are being regulated by the professionals, say that this is actually good information. These are good data. Now, what I want to do as a surgeon is very quickly just take you on a bit of a cruise down the gut. I'm not going to talk about lungs because I'm not a, thrust, a, a chest surgeon. I want to talk about the, going down the gut a bit. I'm going to show some graphic pictures. I'm going to show some gory pictures. So it's, if it comes to anything gory you don't want to see, I'll say look away now before we see it, okay? But most people like a bit of gore. But I want to start off with a bit of information, really. And let's start with the stomach, first of all. Now, this is the one that's frequently managed very badly by my colleagues. Carcinoid is actually very common in the stomach. And it comes in three different groups. And we call group one, and I'll show you a picture of group one very shortly, type one. 
um, is the vast majority. And it's people who've got, actually got pernicious anemia, which is very common. And pernicious anemia is an inability to handle vitamin B. In doing so, you get anemia. What happens, though, is the hormone gastrin from the stomach goes very high. Um, it's I'll show you this picture of the one here. Here's somebody's stomach with type 1 gastric carcinoid at a gastroscopy. A lot of people in this room have had a gastroscopy. This is the view of the stomach at a gastroscopy. And you'll see that, that these little warts on the wall of the stomach. And in this particular case, probably 20, 30, 40 of these little warts, none more than a centimeter in size. These are gastric carcinoid tumors. Now, in type 1, they never become cancerous. The problem is, most of my surgical colleagues don't know this. And they look at that, and they're, oh my God, the stomach's full of carcinoid. So what do they do? Well, the only thing a surgeon can think of is reach for a scalpel. Take that stomach out. Total gastrectomy operation. Render that person a gastric cripple with permanent diarrhea and all sorts of problems afterwards because they think that these are cancerous. Now, these are not. These are the kind of things we will monitor. And we would simply monitor people with this condition, do a gastroscopy once a year. Keep an eye on it. As long as they don't get to about two or three centimeters in size, when you go to meet your maker, take them with you. Okay? So this is type 1 gastric carcinoid, one of the commonest carcinoid tumors we see. But when you first look at it, it looks horrific. Now, however, it's not the only type. There are type 2 and there are type 3. So if people tell you've got gastric carcinoid, the first thing to ask them is, am I type 1, type 2, or type 3? The majority of a type 1, leave me alone. Type 2 is a bit different. Again, it's due to too much gastrin hormone, but it's due to a little tumor somewhere else, a gastrinoma tumor, usually found in the duodenum, the tube that leads out of the stomach. Now, in that case, you will see the same picture as type 1, but in that case, taking out this little gastrinoma tumor will actually cure it. And also, there is a risk that the gastrinoma can turn cancerous. So in the type 2, we hunt the gastrinoma, and if we find it, we'll remove it surgically to get rid of it. Now, type 3, again, is rare. It looks like type 1, but it's solitary, and it's usually a lot bigger. Now, this is the one that we're worried about. The type 3, which thankfully is very rare, has the potential to behave like stomach cancer. So surgery is the best treatment to remove that part of the stomach where it's existing and the lymph glands to which it, it could, might actually drain to because we know that cancers can spread to lymph glands. So the type 3, which is rare, is best managed by the surgeon. So in summary, if you've got type Type, three, type 1, just surveillance, just follow it up with endoscopy, once a year keep an eye on it. Occasionally if they bleed, there might be a place to remove the part of the stomach that makes the gastrin hormone, but not the whole stomach. Turning also to the type 2s and type 3s, again type 2, find that gastrinoma tumour. It is very rare, remove the gastrinoma, remove the thing that's driving the carcinoid, Type 3, we manage those as if it's common or garden stomach cancer. But the results actually for type 3 are much, much better than they are for the common variety of stomach cancer. I want to move a bit further down the bowel now to the small bowel. Now the small bowel, each and one of us have got 20 feet of small bowel. Okay? It connects the stomach to the large bowel or the colon. And it's the commonest site of carcinoid tumours that we find. Now, the small bowel has two halves to it. The upper half we call the jejunum, the lower half we call the ileum, because they have different functions in absorbing food. The carcinoid tumors tend to be in the lower half, the ileum, and are frequently multiple. Not just one, you might have six, seven, eight, or nine, all existing there. And here in the upper part of, this, of the right-hand side is a length of bowel that's been removed from somebody. In the lower part, a close-up view of what these carcinoid tumors look like. And they look like warts. This particular one, we talked to the person who had this tumour and they had 20 to 30 years of symptoms. The GP said you had irritable bowel. They've been going to the GP for ages with this irritable bowel. And because, as I'll show you in a second how it happens, these things block the bowel off intermittently and give you spasm and colic and pain. Now, the problem is diagnosis. As we've said earlier on, the average GP might see one of you in a professional career of 35 years in general practice. The average hospital consultant 
probably sees one of you in the average career as a hospital consultant. We, as a group, have about 800 of you guys coming to our clinics on a regular basis. So we're seeing you all the time. We know what happens. We know the history. And it's, well, from our point of view, it's always a very similar story that I wasn't really right for a very long time. And in the case of this small bowel carcinoid, it's really when a lot of people just present with complete bowel obstruction, vomiting continuously because the thing blocks the bowel off, that the penny finally drops. Now, there are different techniques for findings, and I'll show you a couple of them right now. Here's a barium meal x-ray, and this is somebody who's taken barium by mouth, and we take a series of x-rays as the barium goes down the bowels. Now, this is a view of the bowels. And I want to concentrate, really, on this bit here. As you see in the circle there, there's a black area in the middle of this long string of white. And this is the carcinoid tumor. This one is only about two centimeters across. It's, you won't get best in show for a tumor like that size. But it's acting like a ball cock. It's flipping around and it's blocking the bowel off intermittently. And every time it blocks the bowel, you get pain, you feel sick, your bowel stops working. And then it will sort of move a bit, unblock, and things start to work their way through. And you were told that was irritable bowel syndrome because you got a bit of spasm, a bit of pain. And that's this thing. And this has taken probably 10, 15, 20 years to get to this size. Let's just take it to the next one. Now, there's another way of doing this is what we call capsule enteroscopy. And I don't know if anybody here has had a capsule enteroscopy. I certainly haven't had one myself. But we ask you to swallow this thing like a giant horse pill. There's Eunice there, knows that she's had it. <laughs> and it's like a giant horse pill. And it actually has a miniature camera on it. And you swallow this, and it goes down your bowel taking pictures. And this is a view of, that, of a similar carcinoid tumor with, taken through the, entrance, the capsule as it passes by. And you can see this thing virtually blocking off the tube of the bowel. And that's how it causes these symptoms. Um, again, it's fairly high tech. There are only a number of hospitals in the Northwest that have this technology. The test takes about 48 hours. You really need to be in hospital to have it done. You need to be close to the camera, that's close to the recording equipment that's picking up the pictures of, from the camera. In some cases, we collect, the, we collect it off you at the other end when you've passed it out at the bottom end, and we'll process the pictures, not like holiday snaps. <laughs> now, I've said before that the, the problem is it causes our largely mechanical because they can block the bowel off. Um, it has a cancerous potential, but a very slow-growing cancerous potential. These tumors tend to be around for decades, not years. But they will spread if they can, and they like to spread to the lymph nodes, and I'll show you what that means in a second. They can spread across the abdomen. We call this the peritoneum. Or they can try and get to other organs like the liver, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the thing that worries us more than anything else is what we call this fibrosis. Um, what we, call, we have a medical name for this. It's like scarring. We call it desmoplasia. And this is what does the damage. There's something these things are making. They get into your circulation that lay down excessive scar tissue. Sometimes in your hands, we call these contractures. They can affect the heart. They can affect the heart valves. We have one or two people we've had to send off to have new heart valves put in because the heart valves become so scarred. And then that situation becomes dangerous if we can't get new efficient valves in. And it also, can I show you why in a second, can affect the bowels as well. Now in terms of spreading, here we have the lymph glands in the abdomen. And these are the lymph glands that drain away from the bowel and they spread to various parts of the bowel. And they can produce, you see on the right hand side, these big lumps in the abdomen, a CT scan encircled in orange, and these lumps are abnormal. And this is carcinoid that's been there 10, 20 years that spread to the lymph glands around and it's just been slowly growing. And that can have a pressure effect on other organs around it. To give you an example of which, here's somebody not in this room that I've operated on. Okay, this is, and this is a view of their bowels. And what's happened is the tumor has literally gone, maundered down the bowel itself, dragging the bowel behind it. The medical name that we call that intersusception, but the, it's really stuck into the next part of the bowel. Now, what we have to do is pull that tumour out, and we did that, and now looking back a bit, we've got the whole bowel exposed. Now, what matters here, this is a very small tumour I'm dealing with here, but the problem I've got to deal with is that if it's only confined to that bowel and possibly the lymph nodes, what kind of surgery would be effective? 
So here's the main artery feeding the bowel, and here's a lymph gland, and another lymph gland over here affected by the carcinoid. This tumor's been there decades, and over the last 20 years, this tumor has spread to these lymph glands. Although the tumor is very small and right up at the top of the picture, if we're going to clear out all the carcinoid, we have to be a bit more aggressive. So I've got to remove all that bowel because I've got to take the blood supply and the lymph glands. So what is a small tumor might mean losing two or three feet of bowel, which could have an effect on absorption and bowel function, and it might mean that you might have looser bowels for the rest of your life. But the aim was, at that time, to take away all the affected and infected lymph glands by the carcinoid. So that's what we would do that kind of surgery, because we're, in this particular case, we're trying to get rid of everything in one fell swoop. Now, the second problem is this thing, the desmoplasia, the scar tissue. There's another barium meal, and what you'll see here is that all the loops of bowel are all pulled into that area inside the circle. Now, that, this is the scar tissue. This is not the spread of cancer. It's the excessive scar tissue produced in response to the hormones that the carcinoid is making. And this is, can actually lead to the bowel literally strangling itself. And I'll show you a picture of this in a second. The second problem is that it, the scan, it can actually strangle the blood supply. This is an angiogram x-ray of the bowel where we've actually put x-ray dye down the main artery to the bowel, and you'll see that there's a narrowing of that artery. And what happens is, because the artery is being strangled, when you eat and you need blood to get into the bowel to get the food out, there isn't enough blood getting down there, and literally you get angina of the bowel because there's not enough blood getting to it. So you get pain after eating. So this is another cause of pain, nothing due to the fact that cancer is spreading anywhere, but due to excessive scar tissue because of the carcinoid tumor being there and producing too many hormones. Likewise, you can get varicose veins of the bowel. We call these varices. And here in this CT scan, these are like worms. And these, again, are due to excessive strangulation and abnormal circulation, purely down to the scar tissue. So what does that look like if you look at inside you? Well, here's somebody at surgery, and here's the small bowel. On the left-hand side, you can see that the bowel is very purple and dusky. On the right-hand side, it's nice and pink. And the reason it's purple and dusky is its blood supply is being slowed down, it's inefficient, because of the scar tissue caused by the carcinoid. The bowel is not functioning properly, not because of spreading cancer, but because of too much scar tissue. Now, the average surgeon never sees this in their lifetime. And the first time they say, oh my God, what's that? And the next thing they do is they reach for the knife, and the next thing they do is take all your guts out. And then they'll put you on intravenous feeding for life and send you to us to sort this out. And there's nothing we can do, the bowel's gone. We can't put that bowel back in. So this is why we would advise people in your condition to come to us specialists, so that if surgery is required, the timing of that surgery can be done properly, not just with the right surgeon who knows what they're doing and seen it before, but with the right anaesthetist who can also look after your heart disease if you've got that, who can look after your carcinoid crisis if you've got excessive hormone production. So we would advise that that sort of surgery is centralized. What we don't want is this. This poor man was sent to me from North Yorkshire about five years ago, and they've been sitting on him, not knowing what to do for years, and this is what we got to deal with. It's just a huge caked mass of scar tissue. This was the whole of his bowel. And they just sat on this poor guy and not did anything. Oh, I don't know what to do. We'll come back in a year's time. And, see what, and this is what we had to sort out. So really, we want to see people as soon as we can, and then make a decision about the timing of surgery. Um, Certainly, though, in our experience, though, when we come to using surgery for carcinoid, we, these are our own experience here. If those who people can have surgery in the green curve and the silver curve, a green is basement with carcinoid of the bowel, green, silver is carcinoid of the bowel and liver, but we could surgically remove it. The blue curve are patients from the 1990s who came to us at the time when we couldn't remove everything surgically, but we did the treatments, we were starting to use the treatments we're gonna to talk to you about today. And even then, 20 years ago, we got 50% of our patients still living well past 10 years, up to 15 years with this. And that takes into account people dying of old age as well, along the way. But if we can remove it surgically, no matter where it is, we think overall, taking into account people dying of old age and other things and heart disease and going under buses and things, that 
we can keep you going a very long time, and 75% of patients are now living well beyond 10 to 15 years with this condition. With what the textbook said 10, 15 years ago, oh my God, you're not going to see five years. So we've turned this around, but this is not just with surgery, this is bringing everything in as we're talking about it today. Now, what about removing the primary tumour? This is a $64,000 question. We know from our very old data from Sweden that in those patients where we knew it was in the liver and the primary was in place, should we remove it sooner or later? If we left it, well, it could block you off and you could go into St. Elsewhere's on a Saturday night and the locum registrar and the locum anesthetist would operate on the middle of the night. Um, or should we do it in the cold light of day? Now, we don't know the answer to that. The data from Sweden suggests that where you remove the primary in the black curve, that people do better than those which left in place in the other curve. This is the, what we call the survival curve. Again, remember, these are following them out over decades. So we really need to answer that question, and perhaps as a straw poll, if people in this room had to think about it for a clinical trial of where we said, look, can we just watch and wait, providing you watched by us and not St. Elsewhere's? Or would we want us to operate on you now? And what we would do is randomize you to those two. We need to answer the question. Would people be comfortable with a trial like that in this room? Provided you're stuck under us and not St. Elsewhere's. That's excellent, because when I put that question to the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society two years ago, oh, we don't want a trial like that. Nobody will go into it. Um, but we do need to answer this question because we need to know what's the right time to do these operations because we just don't know yet. Now, we've also put our data together looking at the role of surgery. We put our data together uh, across this country, across Manchester, Liverpool and other centres. I'll just go to this curve here where we looked at the, when car carcinoid was involving the liver and what we did with the patients where we took, managed to take, take the small bowel out and remove the primary, and that's in the green curve here. So where we can take the primary out, the survival figures for those in the green curve are certainly better than where it's left inside historically. Now remember, these are historical data from the 1990s. These are not the present time, and the curves are continuing to improve all the time because of the treatments that we're using. But it gives us a guide to suggest that maybe early removal of the primary is a good thing to do if we do it. So this is, again, where surgery would come in. So I'll just skip that and move on a bit to the next area, which is appendix. Appendix is the other very common site for this. Um, it's a disease of young people. This affects teenagers as the predominant group, and it tends to be young girls rather than young, but young men. Usually found accidentally at an appendicectomy. Majority at the tip of the appendix, depends on a little sausage at the tip. Um, but sometimes it's near the base of the appendix, and it's close to the bowel. We worry about that. So what do we do? Well, if the tumours are small, and the vast majority of appendix carcinoids are small, and it's under a centimetre, and it's away from the base of the appendix where it joins the bowel, you're cured. It's virtually unheard of for that to come back. However, if you want lifelong counselling or lifelong follow-up, we're very happy to offer it. But for these patients, if that happens to you, you're cured. The problem is it's slightly bigger. If it's one to two centimetres, there is a small risk that it's behaving more like a cancer and it could start to spread. So what do we do in that situation? If it's more than two centimetres, we worry about them because they tend to be more cancerous than the smaller ones. So we've got to have really got strategies for this, how to deal with this and how we would advise about it. So if it's bigger than two centimetres, we would advise further surgery for that. And that would involve removing the bowel close to the appendix. Now, clearly, if you're 89 years of age and you've got other medical problems and you may have had heart disease or a stroke, that might not be appropriate. But if you're 19 years of age and you've got your rest of your life in front of you, then certainly it would be strongly advised further surgery because there's a risk without that the thing will come back at some point in the future. So if they're very small, under a centimetre, which the majority are 100% cure nowadays, when they get above two centimetres, they start to become more worrying. The long-term outlook is less good. Therefore, the surgery should be done in a specialist center. Briefly, talking about the large bowel or colon, carcinoids can affect there. 
They usually are polyps, but we hope to pick up most of those now in the bowel cancer screening program that's now started. It's now rolled out across the country. Anybody over the age of 60 will be invited to join that. And we would expect that these carcinoid tumors will be detected and dealt with appropriately. I'll skip that slide and that slide. I'm coming now to the pancreatic ones. Now, the pancreatic ones are slightly different because half of them don't function. Half of them don't make hormones. They just get big. And they just sit there, and again, like the bowel ones, they're slow-growing, uh, indolent. Um, but half of them do make hormones, and then they can become problematic because the hormones can do damage. If it makes excessive insulin, it can knock your blood sugar out. Hypoglycemia, which you see in diabetes, based on insulin therapy. So that can be dangerous. If it makes excessive glucagon, that can knock out your insulin and make you diabetic. So all these things can act in different ways. Not the cancerous part of it, but the hormone part of it becomes dangerous. Um, for those that have a cancerous predisposition, more than half, nearly four-fifths, will have already spread to other organs by the time they present over the decades that you've had that tumor sitting there without realizing it's been there. So the question is how you deal with that in that situation. Um, really, as, as Juan has said, the prognosis depends on what we call the grade and the stage. So is it like the very like a Labrador retriever, or is it a rabid chihuahua? And you ha which end of the spectrum is that disease at? The pancreatic ones tend not to be as good in the past as the bowel ones in terms of outlook. However, that has changed in the last two years with the new agents, the new drugs that are now coming into the marketplace, which are changing significantly the outlook. Now, basically, the role of the surgeon here is, if we can, is to remove it. Now, the type of operation depends upon the size of the tumor and the position. The pancreas is quite a big organ, and it runs from the bottom of the stomach over to the spleen. Um, some of them, like the insulinomas, we can just winkle them out, and that deals with it. And it, literally, that's all we have to do. The tumor sits quite discreetly, just winkle that out, and that's the insulinoma solved. Sometimes we have to do more radical surgery. Even though the tumor itself isn't cancerous, we have to do a cancer operation to give the best chance of getting rid of it. So these, that's just saying what Juan's already said. Um, I just want to go, for the sake of time, to the question of the liver, because that's what troubles a lot of us, because people have had this condition for a very long time before diagnosis. In the decades that they've had since the start of it, it may well have moved on to the liver. Now, here are some CT scans of the liver. In the upper one, if you look at this liver, the big gray area to the left of the CT scan, there are gray areas within it. And that is what we call a secondary or a metastasis, a spread of tumor to the liver. And in the lower one, it's across to the left-hand side of it, of it there. Now, in that situation, I, the liver surgeon, can remove these quite easily and quite safely. If it's one or two or three, we can remove these. And if we did that, we reset everything back to before it all happened. We still need to monitor you because there's a risk that you might do it again the rest of your lifetime, but we get rid of the tumor. Now, there may be a case where, in this case, the CT scan shows lots of spots of it. I can't cure that. I can't remove it. I can't take your whole liver out, just leave you without a liver, although we'll talk about liver transplantation at the end. But I can do things to that. I can debulk that. I can use got things like ablation therapy. I've got a microwave ablator. I can get rid of 90% of that. I can't get rid of all of it. But if I can get rid of 90% of that, and it makes you feel better, and it means you come off the injections because they aren't producing excessive hormone again, and that might last two, three, or four years, and get you back to normal life, then I think that's worthwhile doing. So there is a situation where I can actually do an, what we call ablation therapy and knock out as much of the tumor as I physically can without leaving you without a functioning liver. And then that becomes a useful technique. Um, what about liver resection? What does it do? Unfortunately, it hasn't come through on this one. Don't worry. Sorry about that. It didn't show the, um, the survival curve. But I showed the survival curve on the previous, and I'll come back to that later on. This is a question we're always asked. Can I have a liver transplant? Now, I'm going to show you why I think the answer is no, why it's bad for you. Um, the most famous case of liver transplantation for cancer is poor old Steve Jobs. Um, and he went off to Memphis to have his done about three years ago. 
I would not have offered him a transplant, and I'll show you why. Not many people in the literature have had liver transplant. It was about 150, two or three years ago, about 200 now. These are figures from New York, looking at what we call the survival curve. It's 36% survival at five years for a liver transplant. It's a dangerous thing to do, and I'll show you why. These are the figures from France. The biggest series published, 85 patients from the whole of France over 20 years, from lots of hospitals in France, all doing a small number. Do you see the names of the hospital on the left? You see the numbers of transplants from each center across there. The maximum was 12 uh, at Beaujon in Paris. Um, small numbers, small experience. And these are all very good surgeons. But I put it, when you're doing four or five cases in 10 years, you're dabbling. And the problem, firstly, is this. One in six patients was killed by the transplant. 14% mortality of people just having an operation. Now, if you were going on a picnic out there this afternoon, you said to me, what's the chance of rain? And I said to you, it's 10%. You'll say, oh, great, I'll take the brolly, I'll take a risk. If you were going to Manchester Airport this afternoon to fly to New York, and you said, what's the chance of that plane crashing? And I said to you, 10%, you wouldn't get on that plane. If you're going to have this operation, which is basically to keep you going, and the surgeon says, well, I've got a one in six chance I'm going to kill you, are you going to have that operation? When I'm going to show you other data, and one's data, and Shoban's data, that we can do other things to keep people going. I mean, these are just a breakdown of the deaths here, why people died, and it's basically that this is a major operation, and these are the French survival curves. The orange curve is the overall survival, so half are alive five years later, like the New York data. The curve below, the red one, is the fact that it keeps coming back, and it keeps coming back in your transplant. And we've got to give you immunosuppression to stop you rejecting your liver, and that just drives the carcinoid even faster. So it's like putting petrol on a fire. So we would argue strongly against transplantation in this situation. So unfortunately, this is not showing up, this one, unfortunately. Basically, the French people said, well, the people that should have it were those with basically where it was operable and you couldn't do anything else. Those who had well-differentiated tumors, the, the, basically the Labradors, who in fact will do any well whatever you do, no disease outside the liver, well, you do well anyway in that situation. Take the primary out, well, we do that anyway. Um, don't take out all the, and some of these French, poor French patients have their stomachs out, their bowels out, their pancreas out, and they're left with nothing at the end. And I've got here that my survival curve here from our Liverpool patients, again, I've shown you before, where we've actually got in the green curve and the silver curve where we can remove everything with surgery. And historically, in the blue curve from the 1990s, those people, we couldn't remove everything with surgery. If we then superimpose the transplant figures on that, they're actually doing worse. They're the French transplant curves. They're doing worse than doing all the other treatments alone and the risk of being killed by the surgery. Lastly, just briefly, touch on radiofrequency ablation. We've been offering this now for quite some time. Um, it's feasible. We can do it. We can take the tumors out. We can ablate them. We can burn them out. Um, it does work, but we don't know whether that makes people live longer. Um, we've touched on the chemoembolization. I'll just ignore that because one's already done that. And just I get to advance this. A technique that Shoban may talk about, this is radiation injected into the liver, with what we call surspheres, where we inject this into the artery and the liver. Again, anecdotal results of injecting these tumors radiation directly may be beneficial, but this is 10,000 pounds of treatment for each one we do. And we don't know what the long-term effects are on the healthy liver. So it's a new treatment, but it's experimental. So in conclusion, Surgery is the only thing we have at the moment, which if we catch it at the right time in the right people, we offer them the chance of being cured of that tumor. And 50% of people we're now finding are being caught in time where the operation actually does cure that particular tumor, but they still need to stay under surveillance afterwards. However, the evidence for all these things is pretty weak. We need a lot more data. We need a lot more trials. And therefore, our recommendations are not very strong because the evidence is weak. So basically, surgery is possible for some people, it's available for many people, and it will certainly make a lot of people feel better 
It will relieve bowel blockages. It will get rid of the hormones that are making you feel ill. It will get rid of the hormone drive that's causing all the side effects and complications. So there still is a role for surgery. There are some good operations and there are some bad operations. That, I hope, is my take-home message. Thank you.